Hello, my name is Julia Streets and welcome to Diversity Podcast, talking about equality, inclusion and diversity in financial services. On the podcast, we seek to shine a light on positive progress, call out areas requiring further focus and offer lots of ideas to help drive change. And today I'm joined by Yasmin Sheikh and James Melville Ross. Yasmin Sheikh is the founder of Diverse Matters, which helps organisations empower their workforce to be disability confident. She helps organisations become more inclusive with a very keen focus on increasing profitability and improving staff retention. She offers a wide range of consulting services, delivering workshops, coaching and disability focused events. And her career has included working as a city lawyer for some 12 years, She's an international speaker and in 2018 won the Asian Women of Achievement Awards for her work in tackling preconceptions about disability, LGBTQ+, and ethnic minorities. Yasmin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Julia. Pleasure to be here. James Melville Ross is a Senior Managing Director at FTI Consulting, providing senior counsel to companies in reputation management and financial communications. Based in London, James's 25-year career has included work in Europe and also across to the Far East. He is a strong proponent for equality at work and in society and leads the group's diversity and inclusion efforts in EMEA. He is an ambassador for the disability charity Scope and his book about his disabled twins, to for joy was published in 2016. James, welcome to the show. Lovely to talk to you, Julia. Wonderful. So uh, it's 2020, fascinating year for everybody, clearly. Uh, Yasmin, I'm going to come to you first of all. So tell us what you've been sort of focused on. And I'm also really keen to know, has anything changed since the COVID lockdown? Thank you. Good question. So my main focus in 2020 has been really building um, an online training program for my clients, so HR, line managers, disabled people, about how to be more confident around disability issues in the workplace. So a lot of my work was face-to-face training, workshops, live events, and obviously, given the situation that we're in, um, actually the timing was good in a way because it's forced me to sit down and really build that online training, provide webinars and in a, in a suitable format so people can access those in a different way. Um, and also, um, I'm, I'm also pregnant. I'm expecting a baby in, in June, uh, well, beginning of July. Um, and uh, so that's exciting. But, but also, I, I tick another diversity box now in that I will probably need some flexibility, even though I'm self-employed. Um, I will need some flexibility. And um, having online training is probably the way forward to fit around the baby and um, work part time, so that that's that's really sharpened my focus. Um, and COVID nineteen has just made me, has forced me to sit down and build this program, which I've been meaning to do for a very long time. And it's interesting because I think flexibility is the watchword at the moment. So it'll be very interesting to see how this year sort of evolves and and, and plays out uh, all the way through. And congratulations, by the way, for exciting times for you for certain. Um, James, how about you? I mean, what's your been your main focus for this year? And and the same question applies really. What what's changed of late? Well, um, congratulations, first of all, Yasmin. That's very exciting news. Wonderful. Uh, also, I should point out, um, I think you introduced me as the lead for d at our firm. I'm actually co-lead. I don't think that they would entrust responsibility uh, to a white straight man with two surnames in its entirety. So um, uh, just, just to be clear about that. Um, so Focus 2020 for me is the same really as every year, an awareness for disability and understanding. I think it's still the kind of poor relation um, of diversity. It's too difficult, it's too awkward, it's too unfamiliar for so many people. Um, I think uh, Valuable 500's diverse, diverse-ish video, if you haven't seen it, it's absolutely brilliant on this topic. 90% of companies claiming to prioritise diversity and yet only 4% prioritising disability. I think people still see it as a niche consideration, even though there's over one point three billion people worldwide uh, with some form of disability. Um, I think the commercial imperative is still missing from the conversation. Um, Together with their friends and family, that 1.3 billion people account for a spending power of $8 trillion. Um, and not enough organization are recognizing that. I think, uh, you know, there's still more clothing lines for dogs than there are for disabled people, which I think is a wonderful, <laughs> a wonderful stat. Um, as for lockdown, I think pros and cons, really, you know, disabled people are feeling um, 
kind of, uh, I guess, in certain respects, a little bit more included because work is made more straightforward. Uh, social lives are easier to access without the transport issues and um, uh, access to venues that uh, that normally cause problems. Um, and in many ways, isolation is a permanent state for for a lot of disabled people. So, in some in some cases, this really isn't anything new. I think the virus has also sparked a wave of public empathy, which has been positive for for the disabled community. That said, I think there's a bit of a fear factor here, um, a worry about the virus itself. You know, we had this hideous news early in the process here in the UK about um, do not resuscitate advisories coming from the British Medical Council, um, which made uh, those in the community sort of feel very, very worried indeed. And of course, the economic impact, you know, life is three times more expensive for most disabled people. Um, the budget cuts for local authorities, suspension of critical charities that we all rely on. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the irritation of still not having British Sign Language at the government daily summaries <laughs> is still causing consternation for some of us. So um, there have been pros and cons, I'd say. Thank, thank you, James. And there's certainly a lot in that that we'll, we'll unpick for sure. And, uh, and I mean, Yasmin, if I may just come to you, I mean, you describe yourself when we've been doing our sort of preparation for the podcast, you describe yourself as a full time wheelchair user. And I would love you if you could share some of your insights into your personal experience. Gosh, that is a massive question. Um, well, initially, um, the, when I was first injured, I had a, a spinal stroke back in 2008. So I was 29 years old and uh, came as a huge shock as somebody never spent any time in hospital whatsoever. And I fell into that category where 86% of disabled people actually acquire their disability whilst at working age. Um, and I was working at the time as a, as a lawyer in the city, as you said in your introduction, in a big firm. And ironically, I was practicing personal injury law. You can't make this stuff up, can you? It's the shock of having a different body, because when you have a spinal cord injury, it's not just the not walking. In fact, you realize that's almost the least of the issues. Your bodily functions change, your skin, everything, bladder, you know, it's personal care, um, the way you wash, dress. And then it's the huge psychological adjustment that you have to make about how you see yourself differently, but how you identify now and how other people look at you as well. And when I came out of rehab, I was off work for about a year. What, I, what struck me was obviously the way I move around is different, the lack of accessibility, all the, you know, I was 29 years old in my prime, all the pubs, clubs, favorite places to go, restaurants, hugely inaccessible and I live in London I was shocked that hardly you know any train stations were accessible and if they were we pray that the lift was in in order um and once you sort of get more familiar with where you can go and boring things like where to find a, a functioning disabled toilet which hasn't got a load of rubbish um used as a store cupboard which is another issue or they put a, a table in front of um the disabled toilet and you've got to disturb lots of guests. I mean, it's it's sometimes the little things that really bug you that is quite frankly, sometimes it's exhausting being a disabled person. And that's just a small insight. Um, what I realise in, in terms of the workplace is when you've navigated the travel, the lack of accessibility, um, you know, I had to get a taxi to work instead of the train because my usual route wasn't accessible, is how work looked at me, how my bosses looked at me. Now, a lot of this is not all bad. I mean, there is, um, I had a good boss and a bad boss. There's a lot of, I call it misplaced paternalism, where I have a visible disability. And obviously, um, I look different now. And people are trying to do the best. Um, they probably make huge assumptions about what I can't do mostly, not what I can do. People are afraid, and James said, there is still a lot of awkwardness around disability. It is the poor relation. We are frightened to talk about this subject and have a dialogue with disabled people about their career ambitions and aspirations. And I had all of that, but I, I felt that that conversation wasn't really happening when I went back to work. Um, there is very much a soft bigotry of low expectation. And when you feel that, when your bosses sort of communicate that or don't communicate in that, you know, they, they may overlook you for promotion. They may not have a conversation about, oh, would you like to get involved with this presentation to a client? All of these assumptions can play 
out in the workplace, which can undermine your confidence and make you feel that I don't really belong here and maybe I don't really add value and what am I doing here? And this awful sense of gratitude. I'm just grateful to have a job, which I was obviously because I needed familiarity. I could go back to a desk job. I was in a firm which, you know, was catered for me in terms of accessibility. But then my it, my passion for helping clients and getting the best out of me, it, it had died in a way because I felt that nobody was really talking to me in the same way as they did before. Um, so the barriers can be both attitudinal and physical. Um, so it's a very long answer, but it's... <laughs> It's minefield, yeah. And I'm fascinated by what you were saying. But you had a you had a good boss, and you had a not so good boss. I think I think uh, that's kind of the way you described it. So so talk to us about some of the the behaviours and attributes and considerations of your of your good boss. And I'm intrigued to know whether there was anything over time that organisations began to do which impressed you. And which in which enabled your your daily uh, your daily abilities, but also your appreciation of being a high performing individual within an organisation as well. So my good good boss was um, the global HR director, and he saw that I was really interested in diversity and inclusion and disability inclusion. And as Jane said in his introduction, we weren't really talking about disability at, at our firm back then. Um, we were talking about Black, Asian, minority, ethnic, uh, LGBT+, plus, uh, gender equality, mainly gender equality. But we, and, and that's all great, and I tick a lot of those boxes, but nobody was talking about disability. It was a huge misconception. They just thought sticks and wheelchairs, probably. And 97% of conditions uh, or impairments, however you identify, are actually non-visible mental health, cancer, diabetes, dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism. I mean, everybody has been touched by those conditions directly or indirectly at some point in their lives. No one was talking about that. So my good boss, he saw that I was blogging about this issue. I was talking about unconscious bias, unintentional misplaced paternalism. And he then said, you know, I would like you to set up a disability network at work. And people started coming out of the woodwork. We started having conversations about what it felt like to be disabled in the workplace, what adjustments were not in place, what initiatives we wanted to put forward, which policies were potentially discriminatory. We had a, it was a very emotional meeting, actually, the first meeting we had. There were a lot of tears because some people had never, ever spoken about this stuff at work. It was um, really quite moving as well. And there was a kind of, community spirit about we all had very different impairments and health conditions but in some way we could bond together uh, because we had felt marginalized previously and if you don't talk about something sometimes that's even worse because you think I don't belong anywhere nobody's talking about me so it's I always say to companies it's so much better to start a conversation people are very wary about disability but just do something get things going um, on to your second part of the question, you know, what's impressed me about how organisations are, are taking this seriously and putting disability on the agenda is they are starting a conversation. And you know what? You might get it wrong, um, but that's fine. That's how we learn. That's how we get feedback. That's how we improve. We aren't perfect. I am a disabled person, but I don't know everything about disability. And when you cut that's leadership, when you come to a place that you don't know everything, and that's OK. Be led by disabled people who will teach you, who will guide you, who will give you feedback on some of the policies that you may think, well, they're equal to everybody. You know, it's it's not discriminatory. It applies to everybody. Well, actually, potentially they're discriminatory to a particular group, maybe dis disabled people. But because you operate in the world where you might not think about accessibility or different needs, you have blind spots. We all have blind spots. The best organisations start a conversation, they listen and they learn. And the, and the thing I will also say is they embed disability in every aspect of the business. So it isn't just an HR issue. They look at it for in terms of how accessible is our website? Does it have subtitles for the hearing impaired? Um, you know, do we have uh, messages about disability? Do we have role models? 
What about recruitment? Do we ask everybody on an interview? Um, do you need an adjustment? Not just disabled people. It's how you ask the questions. It's actually the best organisations normalise disability. They don't make it into a special status or something different to isolate people. They normalise it so it is part of everyday life and embedded in every aspect of the business. That's that's what I've seen anyway. That's been my experience. What's wonderful there is, you know, starting the conversation, I, and I think the word that, that really bounced out for me was when you talked about the importance of listening and then thinking about some really practical things. So thank you for that. I mean, it's, it's enormously helpful for our listeners to kind of go, we should immediately, immediately start doing some of these things, which is wonderful. Uh, Yasmin, thank you so much for that. And what I'd like to do now is uh, talk to you, James, about, you know, you're, you're a disability champion and, uh, and how this has come about for you, because I know this is also a very personal story for you as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, similar age to Yasmin, really, when when all of this started for us, um, the, uh, the the twins were born um, at 24 weeks. They were a pound and a half when they first arrived. Um, the doctor told us that they had a 20 percent chance of surviving. Um, and I think pretty much everything that could go wrong in that situation did at the start. Heart operations, brain operations, collapsed lungs, hospital superbugs. Um, but they made it um, miraculously. After nine months, they came home to huge celebration. Uh, the celebration was slightly short-lived because soon after we had the diagnosis of severe quadriplegic dystonic cerebral palsy. Obviously, words we weren't massively familiar with at the time, um, but effectively were told that they would be entirely reliant on adult support for every aspect of daily life. Um, and since then, my work, my wife has given up work altogether, um, and I juggle my work responsibilities by day with my nighttime duties as a slightly crap Florence Nightingale. Um, so my eyes have been opened through the experience with Tommy and Alice. Uh, there's a level of uncertainty and disability, a lack of confidence, as we've been talking about in speaking about this. Um, I think it's kind of talked about in slightly fearful and deferential terms by a lot of people, somewhat taboo, and I'd, I'd really love to see that change. And, and for me personally, I'm really just very eager to tell our story to raise awareness, um, partly a desire for the twins to make a, a social contribution. Um, we have, as a family, relied really heavily on state support from uh, from the health, from education, from social services since they arrived. It's unlikely these kids are going to make a significant economic contribution once they reach employment age. So telling their story, we hope you know we can shine a light on the challenges they face and other disabled people face uh, and make our own kind of small contribution to the discussion. And, and it's wonderful that you're, you're such a, uh, an advocate and such a champion, but, but clearly with, with such a personal story behind you as well. I, I'm, I'm intrigued to know when you've been in your organisation and also talking to other organisations as well. Have you have you witnessed any sort of moments of awakening or any corporate breakthroughs almost where people have um, sort of really woken up to the contribution that people with disability, visible or invisible, can make? And, and also um, that have benefited people with disability in the workplace as well? For me, there have been a couple of really interesting campaigns uh, recently in the last few years. Um, Scope and Virgin Media have been working on the Work With Me pledge, uh, which is aiming to close the um, the UK's employment disability gap. So if you're uh, disabled, you're 30% more likely to be unemployed than, uh, than non-disabled. Um, and it's really good sort of practical guidance um, uh, and also highlighting the positive attributes of disabled people, resilience, communication skills, adaptability, those kind of things. And they've been tremendously successful. 60 or so companies signed up there, including the likes of Ford, JCB and Philips. So they're doing a great job. Um, the other one is Caroline Casey at the Valuable 500, who is waging a one woman war on big business to sit up and pay attention here. She's an Exocet missile. She's absolutely fantastic. Um, and she's trying to persuade 500 of the world's biggest companies to commit to talk about disability uh, at board level. And when you talk about breakthrough moments, seeing her on stage last year at Davos alongside the CEO of Unilever and the chairman of Bloomberg was um you know, was was such a big signal to me that um, you know our community was was finally being taken seriously by big business. And it's so important, isn't it? And and we'll make sure that links to all of the videos and all of the research we've talked about today is also on the website for everybody as well. And I can't help but wonder. Um, and in fact, actually, let me come to you first of all, James. I can't help but wonder whether at the moment when we're talking about you know COVID nineteen, we're adapting to new ways of working and more flexibility around working practices as well. 
um, is whether this is a, a greater time for organisations to think quite differently and also you know, to properly engage the full potential of people with disabilities and, and what organisations could be thinking about, could be learning right now. I'd love your thoughts on that. Yeah, I really hope so. It's fascinating, isn't it, how things are changing and how quickly they're changing. If I think about my daughter, Alice, um, and, you know, the context of her, she's uh, 16 now. So, you know, starting to get to the point where she will be working at some point soon. In order for her to access the workplace, um, there would need to be extra space made available for her and her two carers. The IT system would have to be reconfigured to allow for her eye gaze computer to be used. Uh, her employer would need to allow a degree of flexibility around working hours. She gets tired very, very easily. And two months ago, you'd have said there's absolutely no way an employer is ever going to make those kind of allowances because, you know, we're having enough problem just uh, you know, just in, in terms of trying to make it work for returning mums. So it's really interesting to note some of the adjustments that are being talked about now as we start to think about a return to the normal office environment. You know, extra space in offices, things like flexibility with hours, more working from home, trains that have two meters spacing. Disabled community has been looking for allowances and changes to the office and to travel for for years and years. And now some of these things, you know, be happening potentially as a result of COVID. So I'm happy this may, might make life easier for disabled people, but also slightly miffed that these things are only happening now that they affect everyone. Yes, that's right. And, and we're, we're recording this actually in, in self-isolation uh, over a particular platform and I could, I would, we could see each other um, through uh, through video cameras and web cameras as well. And while James was talking there, Yasmin, you were, you were nodding along, smiling, nodding along as well. Love your thoughts to the same question really, which is what, you know, what can organisations learn right now and and what can change but also how do we avoid the risk of returning to the way that things were before i do, I do agree with james that the, the disabled community have been saying you know we've been asking for adjustments and flexibility and non-traditional ways of working for a very long time but the feeling is you always feel you're accommodated and you're fitting into a mold and organizations have to kind of do you uh do something different for you, which can make things difficult. But suddenly we're all in this kind of, uh, in, in this situation where a lot of people have to work from home, adjustments have to be work made. We're looking at non-traditional ways, imaginative ways of communicating um, and um, working in an agile way, which can benefit disabled people. Um, so I'm hoping that after we've come out of this and, um, that we will we will learn lessons. I sound like a politician now, but learn the lessons from from all of this and take the good bits. And I think to avoid um, people going back to the old ways, that um, again, it's 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 having an analysis and listening to disabled people, or, or or actually not just disabled people, but people who need flexibility in the workplace, working parents, people who've got dependents people who probably didn't say they had a health condition before, but they have to now because of they have to shield or work from home because going into the office potentially could be dangerous for them in terms of getting the infection. So maybe they've had to out themselves and now for the first time declare they have a disability or impairment of some kind. What, what, what has worked well during this lockdown, during the time that we're working from home? Uh, what equipment is working well? Um, because a lot of the time organisations may think, oh, it's too expensive to get this equipment or it's just not possible. or This job really doesn't allow flexibility. Well, people are being productive and efficient and they're making it work. Even on top of homeschooling, uh, sharing a room with a partner who could be very annoying. <laughs> um, you know, uh, we've all got these distractions. And, and what I'd like people to learn as well, and I think we are more mindful of it, is people's mental health and well-being during this crisis. While we're working from home, there can be some great benefits as well, but it, it can be isolating. We can miss our colleagues. If we, I think um, employers are checking in more with their employees, making sure that they have all the equipment they need, they have the support that they need, the emotional support. If we could keep that in place as well, um, that would be fantastic. And I think what, what would be great as well is, is that leaders remember that workers are multifaceted human beings you know we, we don't live in a vacuum outside of our professional work we found that you know we're doing our zoom calls and a child may walk in or we'll check out people's books in the background and think 
oh, what are they reading? And it starts conversations. We're learning how to be human again. And I think that is actually a good thing. Um, leadership for me is showing some vulnerability, showing a little bit of yourself. And that goes a, a, an awfully long way when leaders feel that they can be a little bit vulnerable and show a little bit of themselves. Other people feel much more comfortable sharing their own vulnerabilities and sharing their own aspects of their personal life, which sometimes do encroach on the way that you work, on the way that you show up, on the way that you feel that you can belong. And if we can learn to continue that, a lot of good has come out of that. I think um, diversity and inclusion will be firmly um, kept on the agenda, particularly disability inclusion as well. Great. Well, I think that's a wonderful moment to turn to Cynthia and ask her for some research to support today's discussion. The UK Department for Work and Pensions and the Department for Health and Social Care have produced a 2020 report with data up to 2019 called The Employment of Disabled People. The report highlights that employment is increasing for disabled people across a range of measures and the increases in the number of disabled people in employment are linked with increases in the size of the disabled population and overall employment rates, as well as a narrowing of the disability employment gap. There were 4.4 million disabled people aged 16 to 64 in the last quarter of 2019. Thanks, Cynthia. And links to the research can be found on our website, www.diversitypodcast.com. And don't forget that's diversity with a C, not with an S. Diversitypodcast.com, where you can find all our episodes and sign up for early notifications of future recordings. Please do follow us on Twitter at DiversityPod. And Diversity Podcast is available on Bright's Talk and all good podcast channels. We'd love a rating because it all helps to promote the show. It was really interesting, though, before we went to the break, you were talking there about uh, humanity, Yasmin. I want to come back to that point in a second. But but actually, James, before we do that, uh, there's a really important uh, point which you made earlier about um, disability networks and how organisations kind of structure themselves. And you're a disability uh, network champion and run various co-lead, I should say, <laughs> various networks as well. So I'd love your thoughts about what organisations can do to improve the networks themselves. Yes, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're all learning a great deal about new areas and new groups as a result of this crisis. Um, and really, my, my big hope is that we kind of harness some of that level of understanding um, to make an appreciable difference um, for disabled people after this. Um, I suppose a couple of things which I think have worked well for us um, is just sharing stories and talking to people who are in a similar boat. Um, uh, a friend of mine, Rose uh, Nidiban at Freshfields, has set up a, a group of city workers who are parents to disabled kids. And we meet and we talk about experiences within our workplaces and provide thoughts and ideas to one another to encourage each of our employee, uh, employers to be, to be better at the work that we do. Um, I think technology is a really interesting area in all of this, actually. And um, I think people need to think carefully about whether the technology they're using works for everyone. Um, as as Yasmin mentioned earlier, you know, are we using video technology that allows for lip reading? Are we using uh, captioning, for example? Scope's big hack project uh, has got some great data on which uh, which video technology uh, is best to use. Um, and then it's about awareness, I think. Um, our own organization, you know, we had a, a wheelchair day last year to raise money for the wheelchair charity WizKids. And, um, you know, I know different people have different views about the effectiveness of these things. As a wheelchair user, I'd be interested to know Yasmin's view on it. Um, but we had 20 partners spend the day in chairs, and I think it moved everyone's understanding forward a bit, even even my own as somebody who, you know, is very used to pushing wheelchairs um, with, with the twins. Uh, I didn't expect to learn much that was new, um, but I was wrong. Um, you know, I had one experience where I was getting off a train and, um, and somebody said to the colleague who I was with, does he need help getting off? And I'd heard about this happening to other people, but I'd never, you know, to witness it firsthand was quite quite an affront. The assumption that I wasn't capable of answer, answering that question myself um, by virtue of me sitting down rather than standing up seemed uh, seemed a bit of an oddity. So um, uh, lots lots to do and, and, and lots of different ways in which uh, I think we can improve um, the way that we think about this topic. And, and yes, what are your thoughts there in response to what James was saying? Well, funnily enough, I run my own wheelchair uh, challenge, I call it. Uh, really get to spend time uh, in a wheelchair. And, you know, it has different reactions. Um, 
the whole point of the initiative, it is so in your face, so confrontational that firstly, senior leaders spending a day in a chair, um, it, it gives visibility to disability. And we are not saying, you know what, you spend a day in a chair, you know everything about disability. No, you don't. You have, you know, you have a mere glimpse, but what it, it literally gets people, well, not in their shoes, but in their wheels, if you like, to think about it in a different way. And uh, it's funny you picked up on, James, how it feels when you are the person in the chair and you have a, a comment directed at somebody else. So I remember when I did the initiative at Thomson Reuters, um, they, one guy was in the chair and another guy just started pushing him without even asking. And that happens to me probably once every two months. And and uh, the guy who was in the chair was just shocked. He said, you know, I just felt that he'd taken my autonomy completely away. He didn't even ask me. The assumption was I just needed help. And I said, felt that sense of achievement. I was just getting there to the other side of the road. It was gone, just like that. And until you experience it yourself, I can tell you stories all day long about my experiences. But if you spend a day with me or if you spend a day in a chair, you just have a mere glimpse and insight into what what it's like you're not going to know everything but sometimes it's the only way for people to really get the message but what it does as well it's I mean people in wheelchairs are a very small minority in the disability community however it gives visibility to, to disability I found in the organizations who do the wheelchair challenge they then start having other conversations about all, all kinds of impairments and disabilities that just would not be talked about if it wasn't for such a confrontational um, initiative. And also, if people don't like it, they may, may see it as patronising or insulting in some way. I understand that. But again, it starts a conversation. There's usually something behind that in that they're disgruntled about how work has dealt with disabled people or the fact that they don't feel included. It starts an uncomfortable conversation. We need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. That's what I say. Yeah, and you were you were talking earlier about you know, the importance of organisations starting the conversation, and of course th this gives um, gives way to having a slightly different conversation, or perhaps a more sophisticated conversation based in the reality of of using a wheelchair during the day. And I can't help but wonder whether, particularly now in these kind of COVID nineteen related times, is whether there's going to be we see greater humanity around the conversation, and whether or not. We have expectations of that changing the way in which people lead organisations as well. Yes, I, mean, I really love your thoughts on that. And then, James, I'll come to you for yours. Yeah. I mean, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but I think what it's shown is it's not just disabled people, but we all feel a little bit vulnerable right now. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, we're all working in very different ways. It's unsettling. We don't know, you know, when we do come out of lockdown, how things will be uh, two meter rule apart, and how things are going to happen on you know public transport. We and our personal lives have really been brought brought to the fore, which makes us vulnerable as well because we've had to have conversations with leaders, with managers about some of the aspects of our private life and how we navigate those as well, while still trying to uh, work effectively and produce good quality work. It's forced us to have these conversations. But also for managers, they're, they're, they're dealing with a stressful situation. They're dealing with their own issues, um, but they're also trying to manage a team remotely. So it's shown a, a great level of humanity, this crisis, in, in that people have had to have conversations they probably have never had before, which can be sometimes a good thing um, as well. And as I said, it shows that we are multifaceted human beings. Um, and I think... In some ways, it's increased our level of communication, our dialogue, and made us think about the simple things like listening, um, checking on someone's well-being, having a conversation, not necessarily about work, but just saying, how are you? How are you, how are you juggling all of this? Is there anything I can do? What else can I do to support you? We're actually, maybe we don't have these conversations pre-COVID. Maybe we're having them more because we have to, because this is an unprecedented situation and I think leadership involves all of those qualities being able to go there even if you're uncomfortable but 
it, we've got to shine a light on it. Otherwise, um, we're gonna, it's going to cause more problems, I think. And I think it's proven that, you know, in this whole conversation about empathetic leadership mm. is arguably before it was kind of seen as being those softer skills. Everybody wants to kind of hone on the hard skills, but the softer skills, well, you know, not quite so good at those. But actually those leaders who are being very effective at the moment are really tuning into flexing those softer skill muscles, arguably. And and James, I'd say I'm really keen to hear sort of hear your, your thoughts on this as well, but also extending a little bit further into I mean, I'm really, really keen to make sure that this stays high on the agenda about diversity and inclusion. So wrapped into the humanity of leadership, but also are there things that we should be doing to make sure that this conversation stays high on the agenda? Um, yes, I think um, the leadership point is, is fascinating to me as well. I think the conversations that I was having prior to COVID with CEOs about um, prioritising this topic um, nine out of 10 of those conversations, I think CEOs were saying to me, what's everybody else doing? You know, there's a stunning lack of kind of imagination and uh, and, and well, leadership really on this particular topic. Uh, and they're just keen to know that they're not being left behind rather than wanting to lead, which is, uh, which is a shame. Um, as for keeping diversity on the agenda, I think I, I do worry that it becomes deprioritized. I was a bit worried to see the decision to allow companies to delay gender pay reporting uh, come through as a result of the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, I think that then has a knock-on effect for those of us who are waiting and hoping for mandatory reporting on BAME and disability and those other topics. And it's going to be even longer now, I think, for those things to happen. Um, so I think it's really incumbent on those of us in the community to keep the pressure up, to keep thinking about clever campaigns and bang at the drum. Uh, for for diversity and I think also to be creative about the way that we're thinking about making adjustments. Um, a lovely story, um, I met with a chap from um, uh, from the Department of Transport a few years ago. He's a dad to a severely autistic son, teenage son, and the first few hours of his day sounded horrific, getting his son out of bed, feeding him, getting him dressed, getting him on the bus and then, uh, and then to school. Highly kind of stressful experience at the beginning of every single day for him and his colleagues. Um, understood this and understood that they weren't to put meetings in his diary until 10 o'clock in the morning. So they had an hour at the beginning of every day to decompress, calm down and get to a point where, you know, he was ready to, to face the day. So I love, I like that kind of creativity from colleagues to show we understand your situation and we want to adapt um, to make it work well for you. And it really feels to me like, like now more than ever, you know, I, I talk to people all the time and they're like, actually, I need to carve out my day differently. I need to work very differently. And that's, you know, that that's as an extension of that is, is everybody should be having that conversation about how does your working day work for you? And of course, you know, then the benefits of that will be just enormous as well. I can't believe, you know, as I said this at the end of every episode, how time just flies. It's incredible. Um, I'm, I'm really keen to hear what you're optimistic about, you know, particularly as we as in these really extraordinary times and as we look ahead. Uh, Yasmin, let me come to you first of all. Uh, what are you optimistic about at the moment? Well, what James just shared with us, that, that gives me hope as well, and that we are not being wedded to traditional ways of working, thinking people have to work the strict nine to five, we're becoming more imaginative, more empathic towards people who have different needs and different requirements. It's not saying to them, you know what, we're, we're giving you an easier time and you're coming in later. No, they have different circumstances and it doesn't mean um, that they're less efficient or productive. It's just, you know, putting people on a level playing field. And I'm optimistic about the fact that accessibility, um, because we've had to make the adjustments for people, um, you know, by and large, it's proved that it was possible all along. And COVID-19 has just forced us into this situation. So I'm hopeful and optimistic that some of those arrangements which are working perfectly well will stay in place. It will be harder for employers to say, you know what, this isn't a job where you could have flexibility or it, you, you really need to be in the office. Actually, we're managing OK as we are and in some ways even better. So I'm hopeful that those arrangements stay in place. Um, and uh, we, we can get more disabled people contributing, feeling more valuable um, and thinking about actually possibly, you know, promoting, hiring, um, you know, being more ambitious when it comes to disability, because sometimes people need an example of how it works well, because, you know, a lot of people are fearful or ignorance, ignorant really about what disabled people can and cannot do. So 
if you've seen it work um, well where people are working effectively at home or in a different way, um, you might it might um, hopefully give you uh, proof that this can work in the future for other people as well. And the words you used earlier about, you know, the soft bigotry of low expectation. Let's all just aim higher, you know, because there's so much potential. There's so much opportunity. You know, you've been using words like you know, efficiency and productivity. And of course, a flexible model can can really achieve that. Uh, James, I'd love to hear your final thoughts about, you know, what are you particularly optimistic about at the moment? Yes, funnily that fr- that phrase was one that I scribbled down as well because I think uh, it really chimed with me. It's um, you know since the twins were born, I think they've been dealing with that, um, and every time we've had an expectation for them, we've had um, sort of side sidelined looks from <laughs> from, from medical staff. And, uh, uh, so yeah, that really that really appealed to me that uh, that idea. Um, I'm really optimistic about what technology can bring in all of this. Um, really excited about that. Um, I think, you know, being part of some really interesting conversations at the moment with Scope, particularly around their big hack campaign, helping to, to big tech to think about how uh, accessibility gets designed into technology products and websites, you know, right from the start rather than as an afterthought. Um, and I'm also kind of interested to see where we go with this gear change in public perceptions whether it sustains us um, you know I think we've all learned over the course of the last few months just what's important in terms of families and friends and also we've learned to value uh, those people who are working in the shadows to bring so much value to our country um, and I really really hope that, that we can sustain that um, uh, in, in future years as well. It's been the most wonderful conversation. I can't tell you how grateful I am for you both taking time out of uh, not only busy days because you're both incredibly, <laughs> exceptionally busy, but also to share your stories about your personal journeys as well and your, and your personal um, backgrounds and your familial circumstances. Yasmin, we wish you every success. As, as uh, It's an exciting year for you, for sure. And, and James, thank you for sharing the story about your twins as well. It's been a wonderful conversation. And as always, to all our listeners at Diversity Podcast, thank you for listening. James, Yasmin, thank you. Thank you, Julia. It's been really brilliant being here. Thank you for a wonderful conversation. This episode of Diversity Podcast was produced by me, Kieran Yates, on behalf of Julia Streets Productions. Thanks to Cynthia Akinsania for her insights. You can find out more about the guests on this week's show on our website, diversitypodcast.com. And that's diversity with a C, not an S. Whilst you're there, you can also sign up to our newsletter for all our latest updates. All our episodes are available in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favourite podcast app. If you enjoy Diversity Podcast, remember to share on social media and give us a rating or review. It really helps promote the show to a wider audience. Finally, our Twitter handle is at DiversityPod. Thanks for listening.